everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Bones and Stones. Today, uh, we have Amy Hatton uh, coming to talk to us, who is, um, has done some uh, honors work at U uh, UCT in Cape Town and is now uh, studying at UCL in London. And uh, she's done some quite interesting research looking at use wear patterns on shell beads that were potentially used as symbolic items, uh, maybe strung as, as necklaces in uh, Middle Stone Age times. They come from a site called Blombos Cave, um, which preserves a, a really nice uh, sort of extended record of the Middle Stone Age. Um, lower layers are in the neighborhood of, of about 100,000 years ago, I, I think if, if I'm correct. Um, and a lot of interesting artifacts coming from those layers as well as from layers about 70,000 years ago. Um, so Amy's come to talk to us uh, and just give us a little bit of a, a rundown of her research. Um, and we're interested in, in sort of the, uh, the research or current research and understanding of going on um, with symbolic items uh, in the archeological record of South Africa. All right, Amy, so could maybe you just give us a, a quick rundown of your, uh, of your research and your, and your interests in the field. Yeah, of course. Um, so yeah, these shell beads from Blombos, they date to around 75,000 years ago. Um, so they're some of the earliest evidence of symbolic behavior. Um, and because they have these, uh, this use wear on them, you can see that they were strung pads as necklaces. Um, and with my research, I was able to map this use wear um, and then compare it between the different levels to show that the styles of the beads were worn and changed through time. Um, oh, that's, and, yeah. that's really fascinating. So um, can you maybe just briefly describe what, what you mean by uh, how patterns change through time? Is it the wear patterns themselves or uh, perhaps the sort of like way that the uh, beads were decorated or strung onto, onto necklaces? Uh, yeah, so the wear patterns themselves um, are different in the different layers um, and then we can trace that there was experiments done by previous research to try and um, experimentally string beads in different styles. Um, so I compared the archaeological beads to those experiments um, so to show that the styles changed through time from kind of like knotted pairs um, to just loosely strung beads. Wow, really, really interesting. Um, and, and so what, what kind of methods did you use to track use wear? Because that's kind of a, a very broad field, but it has a lot of applications in, in archaeology in general, uh, from anything from looking at lithics uh, and, and wear patterns, um, you know, to try to tie the use of lithics to a specific activity. Uh, but the methods can be quite advanced, uh, sort of high tech, um, you know, some, some focusing on sort of microscopy, uh, others may be using some sort of digital software. Uh, can you give us maybe just a breakdown of, of what kind of methods you, you use to look at those shell beads? Yeah, of course. So I just looked at the published diagrams of the beads, so I didn't actually record the user myself. That was from previous research. Um, but then I used techniques that I'd been previously used to look at stone tools. Um, so mapping the useware in GIS um, and then applying statistical models to that map useware. Um, regression models to try and understand which of the experimental arrangements best fit the different um, string and the different use of their patterns in the archaeological beads. Oh, awesome. All right, uh, Matt Lauder, you, you have a question? Yeah, thanks very much, Amy. This is really, really interesting. And uh, I was having a look at your paper and stuff, and I've actually got two questions for you. So maybe jumping the gun a little bit here, but let's maybe just uh, <laughs> uh, get stuck into the first one. So you mentioned a little bit about the uh, experimental stuff and that you uh, relied on previous published works uh, in terms of understanding the, the wear patterns. Because I was actually going to ask, how do they actually do it? I mean, I, I understand the process of stringing the bees together in different ways, but then how do they actually um, replicate the wear process? Do they wear the bees for a certain amount of time? Um, how exactly does that whole process pan out? Do you know? Yeah, so they, um, they tested quite a few different things. Um, and I think, you know, they didn't really have anything to go off of. So they just tried a few different string patterns. But they actually had to add acid to the string. And also, there wasn't any abrasion for those little strings on the shaker for three hours. Um, and then recorded the use wear patterns from those. 
Water, you said you had a second question. Do you want to maybe ask quickly? Uh, yeah, sure. Just another thing with regards to publishing, going for an international journal is quite a big thing, especially coming out of the Honours Project. And, and, and I must say, congratulations. Well done. Obviously, not everybody does that. But what um, <laughs> helped you along with your decision uh, in terms of going for an international journal? I, I imagine this was a decision that you took uh, you know, quite carefully with your supervisor based on the quality of your work. Yeah, definitely. Um, so my supervisor, Jane Wilkins, um, yeah, she suggested that. Um, and it was really only possible, you know, with her help and guidance in that process. Um, I kind of, yeah, I would never have imagined <laughs> publishing my work in an international journal. Um, but she really helped and, yeah. Uh, okay, sorry, Tim, you, you, had a, you had a question. Yeah, I did have a question before you had, you jumped me and went straight to Matt, and then he had two <laughs> questions. I mean, it's uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> Apologies. Just you know, follows, I've got three questions. No, I'm joking. I don't have three questions either. <laughs> um, so I, I was just wondering, with regards to the shell beads, um, and you said they've been strung into a necklace. How do you look at different wearing patterns? Like, for example, if it's a necklace against skin or something strung onto clothing, for example, and then do you think? If you look at these beads and in terms of their meaning and their value in the past, um, what would these sort of, or what are the ideas behind what these might have meant? Yeah, so I think at the moment the experimental work has just been looking at the beads being strung as necklaces, but I think there's a really good chance that they were probably strung in more complicated um, methods and, you know, creating like clothing and that sort of thing. Um, and I think, you know, there's really opportunities for people to do more experimental work to try and understand that better. Um, and then, sorry, what was your other question? With regards to the meaning of the beads, what are the ideas? Um, yeah, so basically, you know, this is just showing that there was really early expressions of symbolism. Um, and perhaps people used these different styles to communicate, you know, their group affiliation or other important factors like that. Yeah, what I, what I find really interesting about them is the potential uh, behind exchange as well. You know, handing these items over between different groups. Um, and then obviously what yeah, that definitely. implies in terms of trading or exchanging items, uh, shared networks and relations and so on. It's, it's really quite exciting stuff. Yeah, it really is. And I think, you know, obviously ostrich egg shells um, ha can tell us a lot of information as well. So... Yeah, I think, I mean, it feels like there hasn't been much research into ostrich egg shell beads um, recently. And I think, mm. yeah, there really should be. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's the new, the new frontier for expansion, potentially. Uh, yeah. Matt, you, you had a, a, another question? Yeah, no, so it was just an observation. First of all, uh, I was going to say that um, my question that was linked towards how they actually understand these wear patterns was more directed at myself because both Tim and Matt know how many bangles and beads I used to wear back in the day. So I was definitely a potential test candidate <laughs> for understanding wear patterns with beads. Anyways, but just to, just to come to another question, um, changes through time. Uh, if I remember correctly, there was something that you touched on as well within the paper is w were there um, significant changes in the production methods through time with the beads? Could you see, could you see distinct wear patterns changing through time? Um, yeah, so with my statistical models, um, I was able to show that, yeah, the wear patterns are different um, through different time periods, but they're all kind of within those um, Middle Stone Age layers. So they're all around 70, 75,000 years ago. So it's not like a big time period between oh, okay. the different layers. Okay. Awesome. Uh, Amy, if I can ask a, a quick question, just uh, getting back to the publishing um, side of, of things. Uh, obviously, it's a daunting task for uh, many young students, and particularly those who have not experienced it before. And, and obviously, students do rely heavily on, uh, on supervision uh, and, and their supervisors to sort of guide them through. Uh, can you maybe just give us a, a quick uh, rundown of sort of like the, the challenges uh, that you might have faced uh, was it an easy process? Was it very difficult? Uh, and, and maybe what was the sort of most challenging part of, of the publishing process? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, it's very daunting. And um, I think the thing that struck me was just how long it takes. Um, you know, first from the beginning, just, you know, I had my thesis and then I first had to cut that down um, probably by about half um, to get the word count to be in the right amount for a paper. 
and then you know getting all the files ready and all of the things that you need in order to finally submit it uh, and then you know there's like the scary weight of hearing back um, and getting the reviewer comments and obviously like <laughs> I, I don't know how other people deal but I don't deal very well with criticism um, but all of the reviewers comments were very helpful um, but it is always difficult you know reading that and then having to submit it again um, and luckily it got accepted then um, yeah so I think all in all it's just a really long process and it is difficult and you need someone to help you and you know kind of like champion you to get through all of that um, yeah my my first paper I published I got my reviews back and I cried for about a week uh, I think it's quite typical and then as I keep publishing I cry a little less uh, but it's still sometimes the review comments just sort of is like a, a dagger to the heart in, in a bit yeah exactly. uh, in any case okay uh, Tim you you have a you have a question yeah, I think when the reviewers get your paper they also cry quite a bit too so of course they do, yes. <laughs> of, of, of the atrocious spelling errors and the grammatical do I have nonsense, to do one yeah. of his papers again <laughs> <laughs> no, the reviewer comments can be really horrible. I think we all had our fair share of nasty ones and really nice ones as well. So, uh, Amy, just to sort of, I mean, probably a last question, but you are now doing your master's at UCL, am I correct? Yeah, that's correct. How's that all going? How's the transition from, from South Africa or Cape Town to London and, and how's the research going? Um, yeah, it's going well. Um, obviously, it's a big transition, but I think... Um, often we look towards these international institutions as kind of these amazing and so much better maybe than South African ones, but I really don't think that's the truth. I think the quality is definitely comparable um, with our South African institutions and the ones internationally. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's been an amazing experience um, and I've really learned a lot. Yeah, I think that's a really a really good point that like when because I, I was lucky enough to go overseas as well and there's so many great strengths in our institutions until Lotta came along, but there's so many great strengths in our local institutions. Um, and you, know, you do think, oh, Europe is going to be amazing, and, and it is, but you also realize that um, our, our universities are um, great places to, to be learning in as well. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, I think that's going to wrap up time for us. Uh, Amy, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to, to speak with us. I think we're all um, you know, sort of resoundingly um, impressed by your uh, your publishing record to date, um, and uh, we we wish you the best of success in the in the future, and and we'll keep an eye out for your future research. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much. It was really interesting. Thank you.